Section four of chapter one, modernity, the globalization of Western culture, liberal multiculturalism, and the military empire of the preventative war, quote unquote. Notice that within this he is talking about liberal multiculturalism. <clears throat> Again, the main topic of, of our course is this liberal multiculturalism. And here we're not merely, uh, you know, as we see with DeSalle, we're not merely um, trying to indoctrinate the student with some kind of liberal multiculturalism. We're taking that as a problematic category and actually analyzing it philosophically. This is, this is a critical attitude towards multiculturalism. Okay, although the question had been glimpsed intuitively since the end of the 1950s, there was a gradual theoretical shift from A, the obsession with situating Latin America within world history, which demanded a total reconstruction of that vision of history, to B, calling into question the standard vision of that universal history common to the Hegelian generation that had excluded us since the Eurocentrism of the latter constructed not only a distorted interpretation of non-European cultures, but also, and this, is, uh, and this conclusion was unpredictable in the, in the 50s, and had not been expected a priori, theoretically, an equally inadequate interpretation of its own Western culture. Ah ha ha! this Eurocentric notion of Western culture is mistaken because it doesn't take into account its other, its alter, those excluded from its horizon of view that it ignores. Uh, if you don't understand the community in which you live, you don't understand yourself. Aha. Uh -huh. So Orientalism, a defect in the European interpretation of all cul cultures east of Europe, as Edward Said shows in his famous 1978 text, Orientalism was a defect connected to and simultaneous with Occidentalism. So Orientalism is like Eastism, and Occidentalism is Westism, East versus West. And the Occident is the West, and the Orient is the East in this archaic uh, lingo. So simultaneously, there's an Occidentalism, the misguided interpretation of Europe's own culture. The hypothesis that had permitted us to reject the idea that there was no Latin American culture now enabled us to discover a new critical vision of both peripheral and even European culture. This task was undertaken almost simultaneously in all areas of peripheral post-colonial culture, uh, Asia, Africa, and Latin America, although unfortunately to a lesser extent in Europe and the United States. Okay, so here's the real value of this Latin American perspective or African or Asian perspective, but we're focusing on Dussel's Latin American perspective, is that it can see the defaults in Europe's own conception of its own culture because Latin America has this experience of exteriority, of being on the periphery. And so this is a great value, not only to Latin America and to Asia and Africa, etc., but also to us living in the United States. We can become self-critical, and in becoming self-critical, we become self-conscious, like in that Hegelian uh, kind of way. In effect, beginning with the postmodern problematic about the nature of modernity, which is still in the final instance a European vision of modernity, we began to notice that what we ourselves had called postmodern was something distinct from that alluded to by the postmodernists of the 1980s, or at least their definition of phenomenon of modernity, was different from the understanding I had developed through my works that sought to situate Latin America in, in confrontation with a modern culture as seen from the perspective of the colonial periphery 
Okay. Um, so uh, postmodernism begins um, in the late 1960s or the early 1970s, somewhere around that time period, somewhere within 1968 to 1972. Uh, and <clears throat> this is where uh, artists and uh, novelists and poets and painters and sculptors, all different types of creative processes. And even we can see this in, in popular music with rock and roll, um, you know, late 60s and early 70s uh, rock music. Um, there became a, a, a postmodern inflection, you know, so that, so that it became self-critical and was saying, well, we're moving beyond modernism. And of course, this is uh, modernism um, is, is, is very apparent uh, f f in architecture. So if you think of the Empire State Building, that is a modernist building. It's, it's, its architectural form is a modern architecture. And built into the design of the Empire State Building is this idea of modernity and progress and the sort of high achievement of, of enlightened thinking combined with industrial capitalist power. Um, and so uh, you have that. But um, postmodern architecture ultimately ends up being like a Disney concert hall in downtown Los Angeles, which I assume some of us, many of us have seen. Um, <clears throat> but that's like, you know, something that you can actually visit uh, where it's kind of just like free form and trying to negate a lot of the, the, strong lines and rectilinearity of the Empire State Building. It's all wavy and it's even hard to tell like how it stands up the way that it does. Uh, this is sort of postmodern architecture that is deliberately criticizing modern uh, architecture, um, but that's happening in all creative realms. Uh, starting in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And, um, and then in like Hollywood films, you have, have it expressed like in the movie Easy Rider, uh, if you're familiar with that. If not, you know, take a look at Wikipedia and, and, and take a look at that. Uh, sort of changed Hollywood and Hollywood was, after that film especially, was trying to catch up with itself and trying to get on top of this phenomena of this new cinema. Um, okay, so so postmodernism is this conscious effort to try to break with even what was considered modern and hip, just you know, a generation or less than a generation before, just constantly trying to innovate and and uh, reconceive things in uh, sometimes kind of uh, whimsical uh, kind of ways. And what Dussel is saying is that when he was thinking about popular culture and the way that in this Marxist conception of popular culture as, a, as, as conceived within the modes of production, uh, that he was thinking that Latin American culture a lot of what was happening was postmodern. But what he begins to realize, and now he's starting to unpack here, is that Latin American culture couldn't be, Latin American popular culture couldn't be postmodern because it was never modern in the first place. And now he's going to start developing this idea of transmodernity. And that's in the title of the book, right? <clears throat> okay.
So we began to notice that what we ourselves had called postmodern was something distinct from that alluded to by the postmodernists of the 1980s. For that reason, we saw need to reconstruct the concept of modernity from an exterior perspective. That is to say, a global perspective, not provincial like the European perspective. This was necessary because modernity in the United States and Europe had and continues to have a clearly Eurocentric connotation, notorious from Lyotard or G. Batimo through J. Habermas, and in another more subtle manner, even in I. Wallerstein, who we identify with a second Eurocentrism, a second Eurocentrism. Uh, and, and so this is, a, this, is a, this is a criticism of multiculturalism. Europeans through postmodernism, this bourgeois liberal multiculturalism is part of that, but there's an asymmetry, a cultural a power asymmetry, and it's still Eurocentric and it still is a kind of cultural imperialism. Okay. Focusing on this line of argument allowed us to glimpse a problematic and categorical horizon that relaunched again the subject of culture, only this time as a critique of liberal multiculturalism. Okay, as a critique of liberal multiculturalism. Um, again, we're, we're approaching our topic from a critical perspective in this course. And Dussel uh, does a very good job at this. This is nice. OK, uh, as a critique of liberal multiculturalism in the manner of John Rawls, for example, in The Law of Peoples, and also as a critique of the superficial optimism of the ostensible ease with which some suggested the possibility of multicultural communication or dialogue ingenuously or cynically presupposing a symmetry between participants which is non-existent in reality. It's just a concrete fact that there is asymmetry, asymmetry between the core of the empire and the periphery of the empire. Um, and, and then this, this idea of multicultural dialogue in this liberal bourgeois sense is unmasked. And, and that's kind of the essence of liberal bourgeois thinking is they think, well, everybody's equal, but some are more equal than others because some have all the power, namely those on Wall Street, those in Washington. They have a consensus, you know, yeah, we're going to, we're going to help out the world and we're going to, we're going to help out these poor people on the periphery who need our help and can't act on their own. Uh, and in that very act are dominating and exploiting the people that they pretend to be helping. Uh, and, and it goes so far that Dussel now is going to, is really focuses on this because this is kind of the problem that he wants to, to resolve. He, he thinks, actually he mentioned Habermas, he, he takes a lot from, from uh, Jürgen Habermas, um, Dussel is going to say that through genuine dialogue, uh, a genuine multiculturalism can be developed, but that has to be a dialogue where um, there's reciprocity, as uh, Habermas would say, um, but there's a symmetry, uh, as Dussel would say, Dussel wants there to be a symmetry and then two people that are on the same level can have a genuine dialogue. If you're not on the same level of power, then you have a situation of domination. Uh, you know, when, when, when I tell my three-year-old daughter, hey, get in the house, that's not a dialogue, that's not a conversation, right? There's not a symmetry there. Um, uh, but when I'm, you know, talking with my wife about, oh, what are we going to have for dinner, or whatever the case may be, uh, that's a dialogue. That's a genuine, genuine dialogue. So, um, Dussel is is pointing to all this uh, because he's going to unfold this throughout the rest of this book that we're looking at. 
Um, so I'm trying to kind of fill in the gaps because we're going to skip through this, uh, you know. Um, okay, so and the bourgeois liberal attitude, this liberal multiculturalism, tries to pretend that people are equal when they in fact are not equal. And that only reinforces the asymmetry of power because the oppression is not even acknowledged in the so-called conversation. And so it's the whole quote unquote conversation is an act of domination, making people conform and say, oh yeah, multiculturalism. Okay. This was no longer a matter of locating Latin America. It was a matter of trying to situate all of the cultures that today inevitably, inevitably confront each other in all levels of everyday life from communication, education, and research to politics of expansion and cultural or even military resistance. Cultural systems minted throughout the millennia can be torn apart in decades or developed through confrontation with other cultures. No culture is assured survival in advance. All of these issues are, increasing, uh, are of increasing importance today, a crucial moment in the history of cultures of the planet. Okay, so now globalism, globalization is a real economic fact. Uh, look at your shoes. They probably came from China. Your computer probably came from China. Your TV probably came from China. You know, we don't live in an isolated national entity. Um, there is um, uh, commerce, exchange, communication all around the world. Uh, and so uh, this idea of intercultural dialogue in a genuine sense is very important to sell beliefs. In our vision of the course of, uh, uh, in our vision of the course hypothesis for the study of Latin America within universal history and in the initial works of that period, I tended to portray the development of each culture as an independent, independent or autonomous whole. There were contact zones like the Eastern Mediterranean, the Pacific Ocean, and the Euro-Asiatic Euro steppes from Gobi to the Caspian Sea, but I explicitly attributed the unfolding of the world system to the moments of the Portuguese expansion into the South Atlantic and toward the Indian Ocean, or to Spain's discovery of America, or to the first uh, between the great independent cultural ecumens of Amerindian, China, Hindustan, the Islamic world, Bantu cultures, Byzantine and Latin Germanic cultures. This theory would undergo a radical modification due to A. Gunder Frank's uh, proposed 5,000 year world system, which immediately imposed itself on me because it mirrored my own chronology, which changed our panorama. If there existed from firm contacts in the steppes and the deserts of Northeastern Asia through the so-called Silk Route, it was above all the region of Old Persia, first Hellenized around Seleucon, not far from the ruins of Babylon, and later Islamicized uh, Samarkand or Baghdad, that served as the axis around which the Asiatic Afro-Mediterranean world turned. Latin Germanic Euro, Europe was always peripheral, although in the south it carried some weight due the, to the presence of the ancient Roman Empire, but was never the center of that, ma that immense continental mass. The Muslim world from Mindanao in the Philippines, Malacca and Delhi the heart of the Muslim world to the Maghreb, Fez, and Morocco, or the Andalusia of Averroes, Cordoba, was a much more highly developed mercantilist cultural culture, scientifically, theoretically, economically, and culturally than Latin Germanic Europe after the catastrophic German invasions and the Islamic invasions that began in the seventh century. Okay, so this is that history where I emphasized the existence of the Islamic Caliphate and its influence on the Iberian Peninsula and in the time of Averroes and all that. But also what he's saying here is that he originally conceived of, of 
German Latin culture uh, of these what were called barbarian tribes that confronted Rome, but then developed into their own cultural unit. Uh, he was conceiving of that as the center of culture going all the back, way back to this time period and overlooking the centrality of the Islamic Caliphate. Okay, so he was, he was making this same mistake that I, that I was emphasizing we need to disabuse ourselves of in, in ignoring historically the Islamic Empire and the degree to which that was the dominant civilization uh, at the time of its height. Uh, but there is something more going on here that that um, I think I want to emphasize uh, that that cultures develop through confrontation. So just like Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto were complaining about um, German true socialism and even uh, utopian socialism socialism like uh, Owen, the, you know, this idea that you can transform society without class antagonism, Marx and Engels see as problematic uh, and, and as naive and, and, and actually reactionary against the revolution. But Dussel is not taking in that revolutionary perspective here. He's taking more of an evolutionary perspective and saying that whether you like it or not, history happens. And it may not be going in one direction. Uh, and not everybody is guaranteed survival, but those cultures that do survive define themselves in confrontation with other cultures. And he used to think of it in as being cultures that develop independently and then once in a while touch each other and have confrontations and then have cross-cultural interaction. But now he's getting a, a more radical vision of this confrontation, this antagonism, this cultural antagonism, is that the terms on which a culture is defined is rooted in cross-cultural antagonisms. That's how a culture defines itself. Okay, so that, that's really interesting. So he's going from a simplistic way of looking at things to a much more sophisticated and scientifically accurate way of looking at things. Okay. Against to, against, to Max Weber, we must recognize that the great civilizational difference that existed between the future European culture, still underdeveloped, with respect to Islamic culture through the 12th century, the Turkish Siberian invasions would later cut short the great Arabic culture, um, So this cuts against the traditional European Eurocentric view of history. That, that sentence didn't seem like it was, there's something wrong there. But <laughs> um, in the West, modernity, which was initiated with the invasion of America by Spain, whose culture was inherited from the Mediterranean Muslims around Andalusia, and the Italian Renaissance through the Catalan presence in southern Italy is the geopolitical opening for Europe to the Atlantic. It is the unfolding and control of the world system in a strict sense through the oceans and no longer the slow and dangerous continental caravans across the Silk Road and the invention of the colonial system which over 300 years would progressively shift the political economic balance in favor of the peripheral and isolated old Europe. Ah, ha, ha. Now, here he begins to redefine modernity. He says that modernity was invented, it was initiated by the invasion of America by Spain. That's 1492. When I presented modern philosophy, 
Modern philosophy is typically understood as beginning with Descartes in 1637. So that's quite a difference. Um, he's putting modernity a whole century before, uh, more than a century, 140 some years, uh, 140, 150 years earlier than what is typically understood. And even amongst historians, modernity sometimes doesn't even start until uh, the Peace of Westphalia in uh, 1648. So um, this, you know, Descartes, 1637, Peace of Westphalia, 1648, that's generally the consensus view of Eurocentric uh, intellectuals as to the beginning of modernity. He's going to displace modernity into an earlier uh, century. But of course, this is a century dominated by the Spanish Empire, where we saw uh, by the 17th century, by the mid 1600s, we have uh, in England, the bourgeois revolution already beginning. Okay. Um, ba, 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 ba. Okay, so, so he kind of slips this in very subtly here, but he's going to then really hammer this point home later on. Okay. Mm. And notice that this becomes then uh, uh, a, a world system built on on sea travel rather than overland routes like through through the silk uh, the silk road out to the east and then the invention of the colonial system which in my lectures on Bartolome de las Casas uh, I went into some detail and and uh, Dussel then also really focuses on De La Casas uh, in one of the chapters. Uh, I got my book here. Where's the Tandy Thompson? Mm -hmm. in, in chapter two. So Anti-Cartesian Meditations on the Origin of the Philosophical Anti-Discourse of Modernity. He places that, you know, uh, in the, the kind of thinking that arose when um, Spanish colonialism became self-critical of, of the colonial project in the 16th century, in the 1500s. Okay, so um, moving on. This was all uh, was all moreover simultaneous with the origin and development of capitalism, was, which was mercantile in its initial stages based upon the primitive accumulation of capital. That is to say, modernity, colonialism, the world system, and capitalism were all simultaneous and mutually constitutive aspects of the same reality. And so mercantilism is often separated out from capitalism because that is this uh, protectionist uh, accumulation of money wealth, um, which I discussed a little bit in, in my historical survey. Uh, but he's saying that that's really the beginning of capitalism, especially in the form of the uh, Spanish Empire. Before um, the Spanish Armada was sunk, <laughs> excuse me, before the Spanish Armada was sunk off the coast of, of England, and England and the Dutch, you know, began to dominate the seas, there was this earlier phase of colonialism uh, that was infused with a, a kind of capitalism, an infant sort of phase of capitalism in the Spanish Empire. If this is the case, then Spain was the first modern nation. This theory runs contrary to all interpretations of modernity as originating in, centra in central of Europe and the United States, and is even contrary to the opinion of the great majority of contemporary Spanish intellectuals. However, it asserts itself upon us with the increasing force of proportion to the discovery of new arguments. In effect, 
The first modernity, uh, the Iberian modernity from 1492 through approximately 1630, which came to have Muslim tinges through Andalusia, the most educated area of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean during the 12th century, was inspired by the humanist Italian Renaissance. This tendency was firmly implanted by the reform of Cardinal Cisneros, by the university uh, reform of the Salamanca, uh, Salamancan Dominicans, whose second scholastic school was not merely medieval, but in fact, modern. At Salamanca, in Salamanca in Spain, there was a Dominican university. He says the first modern scholastic school, and it's out of this that De La Casas comes. And in particular, a little later by a baroque, uh, the baroque Jesuit culture that in the philosophical figure of Francisco Suarez inaugurated in a strict sense modern metaphysical thinking. Uh, Don Quixote is the first modern literary work of its type in Europe whose characters have each foot in a different world in the Islamic South in the Christian North in the most advanced culture of their era and in emergent European modernity. The first syntactic theory of a Romance language was the guide to Spanish, Castilian grammar edited by Nebrija in 1492. In 1521, the first bourgeois revolution in Castile was put down by Carlos V. The commoners fought to defend their urban charters. Okay, so as we saw at this time of Carlos uh, V, they still conceived of themselves as being in a feudal order, but that feudal order had totally broken down. And so he, uh, uh, Dussel here wants to point to this, this uh, revolt in Castile as the first bourgeois, bourgeois revolution. Um, I, would I would have to look at that closer to, to see if he's correct about this. He's, you know, he's introducing a lot of things that are not uh, common Eurocentric sort of thinking. And, and I, like so himself, was, have been educated in a Eurocentric perspective. But he's trying to undermine that with scientific facts. The first global currency was minted with Mexican and Peruvian silver. And I, you know, I did emphasize that in my treatment, which passed through Sevilla and eventually accumulated in China. This was a pre-bourgeois humanist mercantile modernity, which initiated the expansion of Europe. It was only the second modernity that developed in the United Provinces of the Lowlands of the Netherlands. Okay, so this is the United Provinces from 1588 onward, which had been a Spanish province until the beginning of the 17th century. This was a new stage of modernity, 1630 to 1688, now properly bourgeois in its own right. Okay, and so this is where uh, the Netherlands uh, progressively become independent from Spain. And then of course, uh, in the 1688 culmination is the uh, triumph of William of Orange, not only in the glorious revolution in, in England, but also in, um, you know, substantiating uh, and, and solidifying the independent states of Netherlands against Spain <clears throat> in 1688. Uh, this was a new stage of modernity, now properly bourgeois in its own right. The third modernity, which was English and then later French, extended the earlier model initiated philosophically by Descartes and Spinoza, unfolding with more practical coherence in the possessive individualism of Hobbes, Locke, and Hume. And in my discussion of you know, modern uh, history of modern philosophy, I, I touched upon all these these key figures. With the Industrial Revolution and the Enlightenment, modernity reached its fullest development. And at the same time, colonialism was strengthened through Northern European expansion, first into Asia and later into Africa. Modernity, like the world system, is five centuries old. And both were coextensive with European domination of the world, a Europe which has represented the core since 1492. 
For its part, Latin America was a constitutive moment of modernity. The colonial system could not be futile. A central question for social sciences in general, as demonstrated by Sergio Bagu, but was instead peripheral to the modern capitalist world and thereby to the modern world itself. In this context, we mounted a critique of the indigenous, uh, the ingenuous position that imagined intercultural dialogue as a possible, this liberal bourgeois elite, uh, naive position that imagined intercultural dialogue was a possible and in part idealized multicultural symmetry in which communication between rational beings would be possible. Disor discourse ethics uh, adopted this optimistic position. Uh, and this is Habermas, is, is known for discourse ethics. Uh, discourse as ethics adopted this optimistic position. Richard Rorty and to some extent A. McIntyre demonstrated the complete incommensurability of an impossible communication, or at least its extreme difficulty. In any case, they dispensed with the situatedness of cultures without name, naming them concretely or studying their history and structural content, failing to rec recognize the, asymmetri uh, that the asymmetrical that resulted from their respective positions in the colonial system. Western culture with its obvious Occidentalism, this naive misunderstanding of itself, has pos uh, positioned all other cultures as primitive, pre-modern, traditional, and underdeveloped. Upon delineating a theory of a dialogue between cultures, it may seem that all cultures exist under symmetrical conditions, or that through an ad hoc anthropology, the task of neutral observation, or, the, or in the best cases, engaged observation of primitive cultures can be achieved. In this case, there exist superior cultures of academic cultural anthropology, and the others, the primitives, in both extremes, there are the developed symmetrical cultures and the others that cannot even be situated asymmetrically due to the unsurpassable cultural abyss separating them from the former. It's not just, and Rorty and McIntyre, this is what he's criticizing them with, they're saying that cross-cultural, Rorty and McIntyre are saying that cross-cultural communication is impossible because there isn't commensurability or you know you can't get in the other person's shoes or whatever the case may be but but what uh Ducell is saying here is that they're overlooking the asymmetry and that the asymmetry is the key to understanding the trouble with cross-cultural dialogue when you assume this liberal bourgeois attitude uh, but then nonetheless, even in an asymmetrical situation, there still can be cultural development in cultural antagonisms. Okay, in both extremes, there are the developed symmetrical cultures and the others, the altar, that cannot even be situated asymmetrically due to the unsurpassable cultural abyss separating them from the former. And this is how the periphery cultures like Latin America are ignored by Eurocentric thinking, such as the case of Durkheim and Habermas. In the face of anthropology's observational perspective, there can be no cultural dialogue with China, India, the Islamic world, etc., because they are neither enlightened nor primitive cultures. They are no man's land. They're simply not on the map. These cultures, neither metropolitan nor primitive, are being destroyed by propaganda and the sale of merchandise, material products, which are always cultural, like drinks, food, clothes, vehicles, right? Um, Mercedes, Benz, Coca-Cola. While on the other hand, there is an ostensible attempt to preserve these cultures by valorizing in isolation folkloric elements or secondary cultural moments. A transnational restaurant chain can subsume in its menus a plate typical of a specific, uh, of a specific to a culinary culture like Taco Bell or uh, Chipotle. This passes for respect for other cultures. 
This type of altruistic multiculturalism is clearly formulated in John Rawls' overlapping consensus, which requires the acceptance of certain procedural principles, which are inadvertently and profoundly culturally Western by all members of a political community, while at the same time permitting the diversity of cultural or religious values. Politically, this presupposes assumes that those who establish the dialogue accept a liberal, multicultural, bourgeois state. Overlooking the fact that the very structure of this multicultural state, as institu institutionalized in the present, is an expression of Western cultural culture and restricts the possibility for the survival of all other cultures. Right? Cultural imperialism dominates, exploits, and annihilates. You know, when, when, when there's more Kentucky Fried Chickens in China than there are in the United States, there's something culturally insidious uh, going on in China where this weird um, pop cultural, multicultural food thing is, is distorting Chinese culture. Surreptitiously, a cultural structure has been imposed on the name of purely formal elements of coexistence, which were an expression of the development of a determinate culture, namely European culture. Something that is specific to European culture is seen as objective. So we all just need to, be, need to agree to be rational and objective in a European way, and then we can have a conversation of symmetry with you Latinos, right? Moreover, this liberal state is founded upon an economic structure of transnational capitalism, invisible to its defenders, that has only smoothed out unacceptable anti-Western differences in incorporated cultures, thanks to the previously mentioned overlapping consensus, which results from a prior hollowing out of the critical anti-capitalist elements of those cultures. This sort of sterile multicultural dialogue, which also frequently takes place between universal religions, becomes a, in certain cases an aggressive cultural politics, such as Huntington's call in the class of, class, clash of civilizations, um, where it's really like conceived of as a culture war, for the defense of Western culture through military means particularly against Islamic fundamentalists, under whose soil, they forgot to mention, exist the greatest petroleum reserves in the world, and without referring to the presence of a Christian fundamentalism on a com comparable scale, especially in the United States. Again, they fail to mention that the fundamentalism of the market, as jo George Soros calls it, serves as the foundation for an aggressive military fundamentalism taking the form of preventative wars. Okay, this is in the title of this section, preventative wars, which are disguised as cultural confrontations or as the expression of democratic politi political culture. In this way, we have passed from A, the claim of a symmetrical multicultural dialogue, to B, simple suppression of all dialogue and forced imposition of that same Western culture through military technology. Notice how that happens. First, you have to talk in European terms, and then you still get annihilated with bombs. And this is at least is the pretext, since we have suggested that it is merely about the fulfillment of economic interests, such as the role played by petroleum in the war in Iraq. In their work, Empire, Negri and Hart maintain a certain postmodern perspective in the globalized structure of the world system. It is necessary to place prior to any such vision an interpretation which allows for a more dramatic understanding of the present conjuncture of world history under the military hegemony of North America, the North American state, which as home state for the largest transnational corporations is slowly as when in the Roman Republic Caesar crossed the Rubicon, is transforming from a republic into an empire 
a post-Cold War domination that sets its sights on unipolar control of global power. To what is multicultural dialogue reduced in such a situation, if not to a certain naive recognition of the asymmetries between participants? A certain naive recognition of the asymmetries between participants. This multicultural dialogue. And then we begin to say, oh, we're militarily superior, so they have to listen to us. How is it possible to imagine a symmetrical dialogue given the near impossibility of seizing the technological instruments of capitalism based in military expansion? Will everything be lost and will the imposition of an occidentalism identified more and more by the day with the Americanism of the United States? Erase from the face of the earth all of the universal cultures which have been developing over the last few millennia several thousands of years of culture is very quickly being erased by the, the uh, American imperial military machine. Will English be the only remaining classical language imposed upon humanity, which under such a weight will forget their own traditions? So these preventative wars like in Iraq <clears throat> demonstrate um, the full extent of cultural annihilation, not just cultural domination through asymmetry of power and exploitation, but cultural annihilation, even to the extent of just wiping people out. Okay. 